on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. What I mainly do is try to better understand how ancient people ate, why they ate what they ate, and how those patterns changed over time. I was particularly surprised to learn about this suite of plants that had been domesticated in North America. Also, just the extent of the societies that were here. The lack of preservation of plant remains leaves a big part of the story untold, but I'm sure women were out there digging for tubers and collecting fruit and grains and everything else. A lot of these plants have returned to the wild. What we might think of as wild weeds actually might be feral and regressed from that domesticated state that they were in. Woodlands full of wild wheat and barley. Doesn't that sound nice? Why would you go to the trouble of intensive forms of agriculture? So I don't know where exactly we go from here, but uh, it'll be interesting to see. Episode 154 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Human Dietary Variability with Kristen Gramillion, PhD, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Proper digestion is critical to good health and strong immunity. That's why I'm a huge believer in using Sir Thrival's colostrum daily in my morning blended drinks, and that's why I take Sir Thrival digestive bitters with my meals. In addition to being three times more effective against flu than vaccine in in vivo studies with high-risk patients, bovine colostrum is an outstanding supplement for restoring the delicate lining of the digestive tract, making it a great health support to anyone looking to improve their digestion. And herbal bitters help help increase the flow of bile and other digestive juices, helping ensure we extract more nutrition from the foods we eat. Right now until the end of October, Sir Thrival's flagship colostrum product and herbal digestive bitters are on sale and the coupon code TREAT20 gets you 20% off those products at SirThrival.com. Do you need an antidote to the metaverse? We just launched our newest t-shirt design over at wild-fed.com. It features our antidote to the metaverse tagline on the chest, a wild fed badge on the sleeve, and two tarot style cards juxtaposed on the back, one modeled on the tarot card known as the fool, who's wearing an oculus and absentmindedly walking off the roof of a building with a bag of fast food in one hand and a cell phone in the other. Next to it is a card based on the magician who's juggling four implements, a fishing rod, a rifle, a trap, and a foraging basket. It represents our belief that a life that includes the outdoors inoculates you against believing that an artificial experience of life could ever replace a natural one. You see, for us, being wild-fed, hunting, fishing, and foraging is about a lot more than just getting our groceries. It's an antidote to the metaverse, an act of rebellion against the transhuman agenda that is leading humanity to abandon the natural world in favor of wearing screens over their eyes to live in a virtual one. We choose the natural over the artificial. We choose an antidote to the metaverse. We choose to be fed by the wild. Check out our new shirt at wild-fed.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. My interview today is with Kristen Gramillion, PhD, professor in the Department of Anthropology at Ohio State University. She wrote a book back in 2011 called Ancestral Appetites, looking at the archaeological evidence and ethnographic knowledge we have about human diet throughout our species history. One of the great joys of having a podcast like this is that I get the opportunity to speak to so many experienced and credentialed academics in the fields of interest that I'm passionate about. In conversations with friends, I often liken it to receiving private lectures in a personalized university program. I feel very lucky to get to bounce my own ideas off the folks who study a field of inquiry to which I'm an outside observer. I count that as a blessing. And I love to interview folks like Kristen because deep historical context sets the stage for clearer thought and makes it abundantly obvious just how profoundly confused we've become about what we should or could be eating. Kristen's perspective is refreshing because she isn't taking a dogmatic approach. For instance, she doesn't believe that there's some pure pre-agricultural or traditional diet we should be adhering to. In fact, she's quick to point out both in her book and here on the podcast that humans have successfully added novel foods into our diet throughout our species timeline. 
In some cases, like lactase persistence, our bodies physically change in response to novel foods, a testament to the success of these new dietary changes. Lactase persistence is the adaptation to dairy consumption that's led some populations to continue the production of lactase into adulthood. That's the enzyme that breaks down milk sugars rather than ceasing production after we're weaned. We often say someone's lactose intolerant as if that was a disease or an aberration. However, lactose intolerance in adults is the human biological norm. Lactase persistence is a mutation that allows some of us to easily digest milk products as adults. Those of us that can digest dairy are the mutants. In other words, sometimes our bodies respond favorably to new foods, so we shouldn't be quick to dismiss novel ingredients. We've been discovering them for millennia. But Kristen's also wary of a Soylent Green type of dystopian future diet, the kind of thing that some folks see on the nutritional horizon. Her longtime study of human diet seems to lead to a preference for foods that are recognizable as foods. We discuss that a bit in this interview today, not just where human diets were and are, but where they're headed to. It's an interesting conversation in a continuing dialogue with those who've made this field of inquiry their profession. I'm of the opinion that the more we understand about our history, the clearer the path forward will be. And this will become even more important as we, a rather unique but also very confused species of ape, grapples with an incredibly uncertain future. In the last few decades, food wasn't something many people had to think a lot about, at least in the more opulent nations of the world. But that's changing, and it's poised to change a whole lot more in the coming decade. One way or another, humanity is gearing up to come face to face with our food and our food supply. There's no way around it, and knowing where we've been might just be incredibly important as we move forward into this brave new world. Kristen Grémillon, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Hey, I have been uh, really enjoying your book, Ancestral Appetites, and uh, excited to have you on today. Tell us a little bit about uh, your background, what you do, and, uh, and, and what the focus of your work has been. Well, um, my specialty is archaeobotany, which is the study of archaeological plant remains. So the purpose of that is to, in my case, is to try to better understand how ancient people uh, ate, what they ate, why they ate what they ate, and how those patterns changed over time. So in terms of practical laboratory work, um, what I mainly do is look at what we call plant macro remains, which is basically anything that's big enough to sort of see with the naked eye. You, you need magnification to really get details, but it's things like uh, nuts and nut fragments, seeds, um, you know, all kinds of things that are associated with human food processing and consumption. So uh, that's what I work work with. They're um, actually quite common archaeologically, particularly if they get charred or burned at the right temperature and retain all the features that you need. Um, if you get very lucky, as I have been in my career, you get to work with material that has been uh, preserved for an unusually long period of time due to special environmental conditions. So a lot of my work has been done in uh, rock shelters in eastern Kentucky, which are extremely dry inside. And um, so they preserve seeds and things uh, without having to be burned at all. They survive, have survived very well over thousands of years. Um, so that's, you know, that's sort of my specialty. Um, and then it expands beyond that. But I think this is probably the part that you're most interested in. Well, the area of focus for you, uh, if I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong here, has been North America. Correct. We, um, as you know, had Gail Fritz on, who mm -hmm. um, who wrote her book about Cahokia, feeding Cahokia, and right. in that book, she um, has several plates of um, food remains that were found, caches that were found in rock shelters. So I assume that's the kind of thing you're talking about. Um, exactly. I was just blown away at the preservation. I mean, I it's, just had no idea. Yeah, it's it's really really amazing. Um, yeah, Gail had the great fortunate and privileged to work with material from uh, some of the Arkansas rock shelters. And um, she had the opportunity to look at, you know, entire woven bags of seeds <clears throat> and um, really large collections. Uh, the material from Eastern Kentucky, 
Um, there is some that had been excavated, you know, back in the 20s and 30s. Unfortunately, about 90% of the rock shelters in the area where I worked, uh, Daniel Boone National Forest, have been disturbed by looting, illegal mm-hmm. digging. And I think in many cases, they've taken the, the more obvious artifacts, um, uh, organic artifacts, and they have done a lot of disturbance. So it's harder to interpret the plant materials that we get from those sites, but the preservation is just as good in many cases as what Gail was able to uh, see in her collections. Do, would, is it your suspicion that those artifacts are in private collections somewhere now? Oh, yes. Wow. Oh, yes. It's, <laughs> oh, wow. it's Yeah, they go on the market. I mean, there's a very, uh, very active market in artifacts that are either in some cases, it's it's not illegal in this country to, uh, if you have the landowner's permission, oh, okay. you can take those artifacts and do whatever you want with them. Uh, it's not so in many countries. They protect their, their heritage very carefully. But um, I don't remember what I was going to say next. <laughs> uh, we're talking, a- oh, just the fact that so much has been destroyed. Yeah. Um, so the collections are a lot smaller than we wish. I would love to uh, maybe you could give us like a like a high level overview of what was exactly going on in North America. I think for the average person who maintains even mm-hmm. just a, a light interest in um, our sort of ancestry, we we have not fully understood the North American component. It seems like a lot of that's new, and I was particularly surprised to learn about this um, suite of plants that had been mm-hmm. domesticated in North America. I think also just sort of the extent of the societies that were here. I, I, sh- I just think the average person doesn't really realize. So maybe you could tell us a little right. bit, set that record straight for us. Well, I'll, I'll try to do my best. I'll stick to Eastern North America because that's my area, you know, the East and the Midwest and what I know the best. Um, uh, you're right. It's, you know, we're looking at probably 15,000 years or so of prehistory for the continent. So it's not as extensive as it is in some parts of the world. But <clears throat> the time period that I work with is... Um, represents some of the earliest experimentation with cultivating plants and uh, collecting these wild seeds and seeing them begin to change under domestication. So the people who did that in that early stage, they were primarily hunter-gatherers. They lived in probably in, in small groups maybe coming together at certain times of year for, you know, meetups and ceremonies and trade, but otherwise probably lived in rather small groups. And in the area that I've worked in, they were uh, moving around a fair amount, uh, but they would find places that were comfortable and uh, close to resources, and they would maybe camp out there for a few months or a season or something like that. So they weren't um, on the move on a continual basis, but they were not uh, fully sedentary like we see later on. So uh, this was around, this time period I'm talking about is around uh, about 2000 BC or so. Who, who would these people be, or, or would, do we just say sort of Paleo-Indians because we don't know, or, or is there sort of, do we have a sense of who we're talking about? Right. Paleo-Indian is usually the term that's used for the very earliest, uh, not, the, not the earliest occupants of North America, but the earliest well-known cultures are called Paleo-Indian. Um, and that term isn't usually used for later periods. So we call this in terms of archeological uh, uh, taxonomy, this is part of the um, very late archaic to early woodland period mm-hmm. of time. So it's before um, people may have heard of Hopewell yep. and the mounds. And they may have heard of Mississippian, which is of course Cahokia, which is a huge uh, place. And this is all before that. Okay. So I'm looking at the very early periods when people were uh, not fully settled and not living in villages, 
um, but we're beginning to um, find ways to to take these seeds and cultivate them in known locations where they can. And, and sorry find to interrupt them. again, but so would yeah. this be after Clovis and Folsom? Yes, and, yes, and so very after much after Clovis and Folsom mm-hmm. before Mississippian and Hopewell. Right. Okay. Definitely gotcha. after. So there's this huge long period that we call mm-hmm. just the archaic, <laughs> which is everything <laughs> between Paleo Indian, between Folsom and Clovis, and um, the woodland period, which is when you start to really see the greater development of mound complexes and earthworks. So uh, it's a it's a long span of time. Sometimes I'm very tempted to paint a massive timeline on my walls, and uh, then I'm worried I'll look like a crazy person. But sometimes no. I just want to see it all visually, you know. No, I wish I had one because I <laughs> I get lost. Um, yeah, that's it. It's very especially because we we keep switching back and forth between BC and AD, depending right, or right. BC and BP, mm-hmm. depending <laughs> on what, what journal yeah. you happen to be reading. So you have to translate it in your head. Right. As as far as who these people were. Uh, related to modern day native communities, we don't really know um, that far back. So it's hard to make that connection in that place and with that distant time period. Uh, um, people people have made some guesses about the later sites. One more, one more question about the timeline and then I'll, I'll sort of mm-hmm. let, let that go. But um, I'm just curious. So, so typically, I think growing up, I would hear a lot more like twelve thousand years. Now, I hear a lot more like fifteen thousand years of occupancy mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, there's been this sensational kind of discovery out of White Sands, and I'm just curious: do you give that any credence? And then, secondly, do you expect this timeline will continue to be pushed back, or do you think we're in the zone now? I think we're. I think it may get pushed back a little more, but I think we're pretty close to the zone. I mean, you can't really rule out there. There's a period of time during which um, it would have been feasible for the crossing across the Bering Land Bridge uh, could have been made. Um, it gives a little bit more time, possibly because people could have hung out in Beringia before they moved farther south. So it may be a longer period and a somewhat different route. I don't think it's going to get pushed back too much farther. So I'm still pretty skeptical. You know, if it's 20,000 years or earlier, I want to see some really good evidence. Mm -hmm. I want to see some reliable radiocarbon dates that are in good association with the artifacts. And I want want to be sure they're artifacts too. Um, You know, sometimes some of these materials like quartz, quartzite, um, they don't fracture nicely, and it can be very difficult to tell uh, naturally broken rocks from artifacts. So, you know, it needs scrutiny, but I wouldn't be surprised if it got pushed back a little more. Okay, because uh, several of the folks I've spoken to about this, I kind of keep getting the same thing, which is it seems like the media really picked up that White Sands footprint story and ran with it. But then a lot of the folks I talk to are, are say, you know, hey, like, let's give this a little time. Let's see some right. better evidence and stuff like that. So. Well, the, the more out of line a find is with current knowledge, <clears throat> the greater the burden of of proof, in a sense. Mm-hmm. I don't know this site you're speaking of, White White Sands, you said? I am I, I believe that, that, yeah. One. Oh, in the last few months sometime, there was a footprint. They're dating it to- Oh, a footprint, see. yes. I do yeah, hear about in the that. substrate, 21 to 23,000 years oh, is what the researchers right. put it at. So, you know, this this kind of ran around the headlines a little bit and, and uh, you know, yeah. I, several folks have said, well, we'll give it some time. <laughs> yeah, it needs some time, especially I'm not sure how they did the dating. Mm-hmm. I don't know what kind of dating method was used for that. Okay. Well, I'm not trying to get you too far off track with this anyway. Just kind of curious sort of where, where your work is focused in the timeline and then sort of how you view right. all that. Yeah, but, I'm well past the early colonization course, period. Yeah. And I, and I think um, another thing I just want to add to the conversation is that w- when somebody starts researching, trying to understand the domestication of species, let's say with plants, for instance, it's like you see a lot about you know, the Middle East, you see a lot about China, you see a lot about Peru, but this piece of about North America is sort of unique. I, at least in my reading of it, it's that it's unique in, in that the type of species and the type of agriculture was a little bit different than other places. Is that fair to say? And if not, could you kind of bring us up to speed? No, that's absolutely fair to say. Um, it wasn't, it was not until, 
uh, you know, mid to mid to late ish 20th century, when when people finally became, when the archaeological community in North America as a whole became fully convinced that the that this was actually a form of food production. Um, because they are, the plants involved, as I'm sure you know, are basically weeds. Mm-hmm. And they don't seem very attractive as food sources. And so um, the idea that people domesticating them was really surprising. So it took a while for that to kind of get through. And then another thing that affected um, people's understanding was the changing dates on maize. So there were, for a long time, I think, uh, North American archaeologists equated agriculture with maize. And um, that is sort of true of later time periods, but this early Eastern agricultural complex was very little known. And it was known mainly from the sites that Gail and I have worked on, because there the preservation is so good, uh, you really you can't you can't miss it, <laughs> you know. Whereas when people began doing systematic re- recovery from archaeological soils, they began to see how many uh, seeds and other plant remains were preserved, and so from there it just kind of um, you know grew and grew, and now is an accepted accepted fact um, that this complex existed. Its importance economically is somewhat in question. Uh, We just don't know exactly, uh, was it a seasonal thing? Was it a sort of insurance against a bad year of hunting and gathering? So that part of it hasn't really been uh, settled. But during the woodland period, the time of Hopewell and the mounds, people did utilize them in quantity and quite frequently. So they, I think they were very important, but they were in the context of a larger hunting and gathering e- economy. So I would say these people are forager farmers. So a lot of these plants have, are essentially have returned to the wild there. I guess what we might yeah. think of as wild weeds actually might be feral, feral yeah. and regressed from that domesticated yeah. state that they were in. Right. Yeah. I think that's essentially true. The only one who's really, that's really persisted is the sunflower. Mm-hmm. But the others have all, um, yeah, sort of uh, crept back into their earlier ecological niche before people were managing them. One of the things I really appreciate about your books, you take a bit of a broader view outside, not just looking at North America, but looking at at Homo sapien in general. And you you kind of walk us through these different periods Mm -hmm. of uh, diet and then eventually into cuisine sort of as well as as the social complexities Mm -hmm. uh, enter in. Um, Maybe you could walk us through that a little bit because it's just fascinating to think about these different stages that we've gone through and maybe give us just sort of a brief on that. Gosh, um, I don't know where to begin. Uh, (laughs) I think I began with, you know, the lower Pleistocene. Um, Well, one of the really interesting questions, one of the reasons this book is sort of eclectic and broad is that it came out of a course I taught called Paleo Diet. And in that course, we just went through a whole series of interesting topics from all time periods. So um, during the, well, before the the emergence of Homo sapiens, at some point, uh, hominins, our ancient relatives, began to eat more meat. So there's a really active research area in that. Of course, that's not plants, but uh, um, that's something that, that, you know, we, we now are getting to know more about. Uh, plants do not preserve well, and bones do. So I suspect that there's just a lot of information that we're never going to be able to get about how the earliest humans, talking hundreds of thousands of years ago, 
um, how they utilize plants. I find that part frustrating because it is, you know, I, especially because I think it led to a really um, an overemphasis on the male role in oh, society. Absolutely, it's a and, totally androcentric yeah. view of human subsistence, and not to blame anyone. It's just the evidence so isn't what's there. Re- it's what's like retained. Yeah, people are obsessed with stone tools. Well, a feminist anthropologist many years ago suggested, hey. What about a baby carrier? If you were a woman, isn't that the first thing you would want? Because you're out there foraging with one baby you have to carry and maybe another one walking alongside you. Um, But but the textiles don't preserve. That's it. And the complexity of our fiber arts uh, are just remarkable when you look, um, you know, it when you look at hunter-gatherer fiber arts, you think, wow, this is like God have come from a very ancient tradition. So it's like we, you know, cordage, obviously baskets Mm -hmm. and nets and Mm -hmm. things like that, digging sticks and all those kind of implements, like baskets, all these tools and containers that you would imagine you would have to construct. I was foraging yesterday and I had a basket hanging on my waist, a blicky, and I had a fruit hook to pull branches down. And I thought neither of these things would survive the fossil record. And you would exactly you would <laughs> not know that I ever did this, right? Yeah. And this is long before metals, you know, mm-hmm. so it's un- only under specialized conditions that you're going to find direct evidence of, um, you know, plants that were used. So I, I bring that up because I, f- I feel like sometimes there's this impression that the public has been left with from old science, I assume, but like as if, and, and well, you see it reflected in the modern fad diets, like the carnivore diet where, where mm-hmm. this assumption that all we are meant to eat is meat. And then yeah. you look around at hunter-gatherer societies and you look at the the number of species that they're eating of plants and fungi and algae. And it's, it's absurd to imagine this, for me anyway, it's absurd to imagine this and people go, well, it's the ice age. And it's like, well, they're eating herbivores so the herb- there's obviously plants around you know? <laughs> right so right. yeah just wondering exactly if that part the lack of preservation of plant remains you know leaves a big part of the story untold but i'm sure women were out there digging for tubers and you know collecting fruit and grains and everything else from what we know about hunter-gatherer societies in the recent past uh depending on you know, if you're outside of the arctic Uh, generally women provide most of the calories because the plant resources are more reliable and less risky, whereas hunting is unpredictable. So the women can nearly always come home with something to eat, whereas the man may or may not be successful. Often my wife and I go out to hunt squirrels and she gathers acorns and and she brings home a lot more calories than I do when we do that together. Yes, Um, yes. So, so then, you know, walk us up to this sort of the, the origins of agriculture as sort of as mm-hmm. you look at it. And then I'm, I'm so curious what your thoughts are on, on the why, because yeah. um, there's definitely, it's not like this is just universally advantageous. There's a lot of disadvantages. Exactly. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Many disadvantages, dietary, uh, health wise, uh, increase in population can, you know, lead human groups to get very close to the carrying capacity of the environment. And then when you lose a crop for a year or two, a lot of people will starve. So yeah, there are, we are kind of stuck with it now. So there are many disadvantages. So it is an important question. Why would people do this? If they have these grasses, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of the Near East now, because that's probably the best known and at least one of the earliest places where plant domestication uh, emerged. Um, You know, here you have, they describe, you know, woodlands full of wild wheat and barley. And doesn't that sound nice? You know, get a sickle, go out and harvest it. Well, that's in fact exactly what people did. But then you have to ask yourself, why would you go to the trouble of planting it, especially getting into intensive forms of agriculture where you do a lot, invest a lot of labor. So that is still a legitimate question. And, um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily more efficient energetically. Um, in fact, it may go the opposite way, but it does allow you usually to produce more food for per square unit land than the wild could manage. So, 
you know, that's that's one factor. I, I think a lot about risk. So maybe not so much in the Near East, but in North America, uh, the wintertime, early spring is just a really hungry, hungry time for people. Um, you know, the animals are thin after a long winter. Um, the plants haven't ripened yet. So I think, you know, storage may have been a, a motivator, perhaps, for some of the early experiments with um, planting the crops or those proto crops in a place, number one, where they could be found predictably and uh, under some control. Uh, so I think that's part of it. And also people had their, their settlement uh, pattern, their seasonal round of activities, you know, involved a lot of other resources. Uh, so it might have been important for them to be able to take the, the plants with them and plant them in a convenient location where they could harvest them. So, and that might have actually stimulated some of the changes under domestication because they would have separated them somewhat from the wild populations. So that's another possibility. You know, I don't think there's one big overarching explanation. Uh, I did, there are parts of the world where populations were growing very quickly um, under hunter-gatherer conditions. And that may have put pressure on resources. It may have diminished the availability of wild foods, particularly hunting, particularly game, and uh, provided a motivation for producing more food or more reliable food or uh, plant foods that could be essentially transported with you and tended and uh, manipulated in different ways. One thing I've wondered a lot about, um, particularly when I first started to read about Gobekli Tepe, because I, I would see things like, um, you know, this turns out to be a hunter-gatherer site. Yes. Um, Isn't that say, an amazing place? Well, it's fascinating, right? But then oh I've read, gosh. then I've read, well, maybe 500 slaves working around the clock to construct this thing for years. And then I think, well, 20 miles away is the center of wheat domestication. Is it possible that hierarchical control like that would be a reason or a motivation so that you could feed the because if those people working are not hunting and gathering therefore they need to eat and a hunter gatherer can only gather so much so right is it possible that um some motivations might have been not just an expansion of society but an expansion of it hierarchically and into strata of class we'll get back to the show in a moment but first Hunting is as ancient as humanity itself, and through most of our history, it wasn't just a physical pursuit, it was a spiritual one. One of the ways that human beings came to understand ourselves and our place in the wild world that sustained us. Hunting is still an incredible tool for personal transformation today, helping you discover more about yourself, your environment, the animals you share the world with, and even helping you to develop a deeper understanding of life and death itself. Hunting can help you find your place in the community of life. But you could hunt all your life and never find that kind of transformation. It takes deliberate practice, awareness, and sometimes initiation. That's why my friend Monsal Dented created Sacred Hunting. Sacred Hunting brings new or even experienced hunters out onto the landscape to stalk, harvest, and field dress animals in a retreat type setting in conjunction with sweat lodges, entheogenic plant medicine ceremonies, and strong intention setting that prepares hunters for a lifelong spiritual relationship with themselves, the land, and the animals they hunt. If you want to hunt as a tool for transformation, check out sacredhunting.com. Monsal and his team will guide you through beginner hunts and more experienced hunters will find unique opportunities available across the country and globe. There's only a few spots available for each hunt, so go to sacredhunting.com and complete their two-minute application. Discounts are available if you let them know you heard about them on the Wild Fit Podcast. Again, go to sacredhunting.com and to learn more about Monsal and Sacred Hunting, check out episode 135 of the Wild Fit Podcast. Now, back to the show. You know, that could be the case, but I'm not really sure why people go straight to slaves. Because... You know, the thinking now, at least about a lot of the North American monuments and even the pyramids in Egypt, as they learn more about the, the workers there, these were people who came together for a reason. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, 
presumably an entire community or set of communities had something invested in this incredibly important ritual site. And I believe that they would have, you know, volunteered their time as part of this community project and, you know, a reasonable amount of time. Um, You know, to me, that makes a lot of sense when you look at the scale and to us, it's a mystery what all the images <laughs> yeah. mean and why the thing was built and then covered over, covered up and buried in sand. You know, that's mysterious too. But we think about monuments as things that last. We want them to last forever. But I think for, for ancient people, sometimes it was not the, the result, the end result that was important. It was the process. Yeah. It was the process. So I tend to believe, and I don't have any, you know, proof of this, but thinking is changing in the discipline. And uh, I think it's entirely plausible that you could uh, not, something on that massive scale is indeed truly impressive, but look at, look at Stonehenge. Yeah. You know, there was no, uh, there were no kings of Stonehenge. You know, that was a Neolithic place. These were, you know, farmers, probably with the beginnings of uh, social stratification, but, you know, that was rather late. So a lot of the the monuments, you know, there's really no reason to think that a social hierarchy was necessary. Um, You could have people coordinate the work, but that need not be a permanent position. Mm -hmm. And I think that people had the motivation the way that, you know, some Christians might have motivation to, to get together and build a church for a community. You know, it's, it's something they wanted to do. That's my personal. Well, yeah, well, well said. I appreciate that. Um, What do you mean by that when you said that the, that the field is changing? I'm just curious. um, And, and do you, are you also suggesting maybe we've projected a lot of our current social dilemma oh, yeah. onto the past in that way. In oh, the, I think the- we totally have. I, you know, you can uh, trace the development of more hierarchical societies over time. It doesn't go in a straight line and it varies from place to place. That's another big, you know, essentially unanswered question like the origins of agriculture is why did this happen? Why did these stratified societies develop with, you know, people having disproportionate power and authority over others. Why would people let that happen? You know, (laughs) hunter-gatherers go to a lot of trouble to keep things egalitarian. And that's often the case. So um, I said uh, people's thinking is changing. There's a recent book out that um, I just finished reading, and it's it, you, you might be really interested in it because it's got a lot of ideas in it that are not, um, well, maybe even just a little bit radical, but not unbelievable. So mm-hmm. um, it, it's uh, it's a book called I think it's The Dawn of Everything. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> not <laughs> not very ambitious at all for. A book title. Yes, yeah, the the dawn of everything by David Graeber and David Wingro, and um, they they start to overturn some of these traditional ideas that you know societies kind of evolve in a straight line from hunter gatherers to tribal cultivators to uh, chiefdoms to states, and they upset that apple cart by looking at many examples of societies where there were things like um, social structures that could change from, uh, you know, season to season, Mm. Uh, you know, that there are many other ways. It's not this unilinear pathway. So it's getting harder to uh, justify creating these nice neat categories um, in terms of of, um, social stratification status. I have a friend, the forager Sam Thayer, who's uh, got a manuscript right now unpublished still, but looking at the origins of anthropology and um, boy, some of the early writings are pretty hard to read from a, <laughs> from a um, 
current sort of political correctness perspective, you know, and he, and he's pointing out that a lot of the early stuff was really designed to just sort of prove the superiority of our way of life as sort of Europeans and that, that, that convenient linear trajectory was part of the model they had in mind to show why exactly you know, our sort of civilized agricultural way of life was superior. So it was obviously, um, obviously the best. I mean, that, yeah, that part of it seemed, seemed quite self-evident to them. We, and, we were too stupid to figure out agriculture. Then we figured it out. Now we're here. <laughs> now we're here and we're great. And this is the way things ought to be. Yeah. Those early anthropologists, you know, many, probably most of those social theorists were armchair theorizers like Herbert Spencer, which who is absolutely unreadable. Um, and he was the one who invented the, the phrase survival of the fittest, which Darwin kind of liked and used, but now it gets kind of misused. And, yeah. uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, some of the early ideas were, um, very much in that straight line kind of format culminating in Western civilization. Frustratingly, uh, these things stick in the mind of the public and it takes so many decades for the newer thinking to yeah. filter into the public discourse, right? Right. It, it, that is true. And I think what it took, um, well, early in the 20th century, very late 19th century, um, people started doing really serious ethnography and living with um, non-Western peoples and trying to better understand their their cultures. And likewise, archaeology got better and more discoveries were made. But that whole attitude, and I mean, it continues to today. Mm-hmm. You know, um, yeah, Aryan descent, you know, that there are groups around who use archaeology to try to support their ideas about the superiority of white Europeans. Um, so... Yes, that's that's a page in our discipline. We would we will flip quickly past because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are, early anthropology is implicated in a lot of racist um, yeah. kind yeah. of thinking, and that was the, the that was what what was in the air at the time essentially. So it's taken a very long time for that to change, and it's not gone. A lot of people yeah. think that way. They assume that non-Western peoples are primitive. Uh, I find that in my students all the time when I show them films and they think, wow, you know, I didn't know those kinds of people could do those things. Um, wow. Surprise. But in, we're talking about incredibly sophisticated people and incredible yes. sophisticated life ways. And I'm always want to point out, you know, this agricultural way of life has led us to a tremendous crisis. I mean, we are looking at the confluence trouble. of many crises. One thing that always baffles me is um, we know that agriculture produces surpluses of food and we know surpluses mm-hmm. of food create surpluses of people. And then we look at our massive population problem and we say, well, we need to produce more food for all these people. And I always think, well, yeah, we kind of do, but then we get more people. And then right. the That's, crisis seems to perpetuate. It, and it hunter-gatherer does. societies do seem to be limited by the carrying capacity because the landscape only produces so much food even when tended. And I'm just curious how you look at all that. Well, hunter-gatherers also do things to intensify, to, to try to increase productivity. Uh, but it doesn't look like agriculture. So on the Northwest Coast, they've all always been considered uh, complex or sedentary hunter-gatherers. They're atypical in some way, but it turns out that they manage plants extensively. Uh, they just don't do it in a way that, that Westerners usually recognize. So they, they do some burning and coppicing uh, to increase productivity. So hunter-gatherers also do things that can intensify Uh, They can change their, you know, what prey they go after. Uh, They can broaden their diet to include more things. So there are things that people can do to feed the existing population. Uh, But you're right that as you get more food, it's a very complicated thing culturally and biologically. But um, women probably end up having more babies, uh, it, under what's called natural fertility conditions, um, which I guess presumes that there's no birth control at all 
Although I will tell you <laughs> that I'm pretty sure women throughout yeah. all time <laughs> have mm-hmm. have sought and found ways to terminate pregnancies, you know, that would be really uh, bad for everyone. Yeah. Um, so Tur- but, turns out women have always had agency. Look at that. <laughs> oh, look at that. Isn't that amazing? Shocker. Yeah, shocker. So, yeah, but that's kind of built on the assumption that, that you know, women are content and will, you know, just have baby after baby. And uh, I'm not, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that's a fair assumption, but, but it's certainly different from the way things are now. I mean, and you also need more children if you are doing serious farming. You need kids to help. Uh, mm-hmm. They become part of the labor force. Um, so yes, I, I think we are at a very, uh, very dangerous place in our history. I mean, as you mentioned, for a lot of reasons, climate change is probably the most urgent because we've been sitting on our butts for so long saying, well, you know, maybe we'll do this, maybe we'll do that. And it's really an emergency. Um, but as far as the food supply, it's really a question now. Uh, you know, I mean, I support organic farming and uh, I'm not sure we're at a point where non-industrialized agriculture can feed everybody. Yeah. Did you, have you seen what, what happened in Sri Lanka? No. The Sri not. Lankans basically tried to go organic kind of overnight. and uh-huh. um, But that cut, I believe, I want to say by 40% their production. Um, and that uh, yeah. led to a toppling of the government and a failed state. And uh, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I know yeah. We're, we're looking at a lot of fertilizer shortages. And I think people will see that how much of this food and, and essentially how much of our population has been made out of nitrogen-based fertilizers, really. Right? Well, that's true, you know, and, and that's what permits these huge yields that mm-hmm. permit population growth. And, um, you know, it's it's kind of a ham-fisted way to grow crops. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you grow, you develop one variety, uh, you plant, you know, acres and acres and acres in this one thing. They're all genetically identical, like hybrid corn. And then instead of trying to suit the plant to a certain environment or develop alternative varieties for different situations, you just plant one thing and you dump fertilizer and insecticide all over it, uh, you know, to protect it. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think that's the best way to eat. But I'm not sure, you know, without a drastic population decrease, I'm not sure that we could make it work. I don't, I'm not sure we could produce enough food to feed everyone. I appreciate that you really seem to have a good handle on this conundrum because it seems like a lot of people are missing all this. But um, one of the things that comes up for me is um, you you mentioned sort of how few foods we're eating because we've genetically parsed everything down to like a very small suite of foods. And um, yeah. you, I got this quote out of uh, your book. Um, you say... Um, This responsiveness to the edible environment enacted with tools for extracting a diverse array of resources, both animal and plant, is a defining characteristic of the human nutritional niche. And you talk a lot about this, our variability in diet. It's not something modern Americans are experiencing but uh, so much. But tell us a little bit about that because what's so fascinating is, and I've been very involved in my past in the diet fads and diet wars. Right. And they're all right. looking, you, you talk about this towards the end of your book, they're all looking for this pure approach. Like, what's the pure approach? Right. I always thought, what's the natural human diet? And eventually yes. I came to realize, like, we eat anything we can render edible. Absolutely. Uh, and, and that is, you know, I'm not a nutritionist, but I think a nutritionist would say, and I've heard them say this, the best way to have a nutritionally adequate diet is to eat lots of different things. <laughs> So really, a broad diet for us, I think, is a a good choice, you know, I think, um, because we get, that way we're likely to get all the vitamins and minerals as well as the macronutrients if we keep a broad diet. It seems, too, that it keeps you sort of anti-fragile because you'd have... Mm -hmm. You'd have, let's say, you know, where where modern Americans are relying on, let's say, thirty foods, whereas a hunter gatherer group might know two thousand foods in a pinch. 
Right, so depending on what's one, in their environment. Yeah. Right. So if mm-hmm. some, you know, obviously less in the Arctic and more toward equatorial zones. But but if you have something that fails that year, if I have a bad blueberry year, but I know ten other fruits around at that time, right. I can. But but for us, if we have a failure of wheat, corn, you know, barley, whatever it is, canola, soy, it actually has a tremendous impact and leads to severe hunger across the world. And, and is is it fair to say that famine has been a affected agriculturalists a lot more than hunter gatherers through time. Yeah, because most hunter gatherers can more easily relocate if needed, you know, and yeah. there have been times when farmers had to relocate like in the southwest during the the mega droughts. Um, you know, they just picked up house and just moved somewhere completely different where things were a little better. But I think uh yeah, I think famine has been with us forever at least the the possibility of it but you're right i think agriculturalists are are more vulnerable because of the yes the reliance on fewer foods so we don't have as many uh what we sometimes called uh fallback foods or i forget the other term that's used sometimes um you know other things that we can that we can use to replace things that aren't available mm-hmm. um You know, I mean, at some point it's just going to be, you know, soccer moms complaining that they can't get their unseasonal fruit. (laughs) (laughs) You know, that's another thing that's very kind of unnatural about the way we live. And yeah, I love it as much as anybody else being able to get fresh fruit. Well, fresh in quotes uh, (laughs) year round, but it, but it just costs us in terms of fossil fuels. And, you know, so that's why eating locally is so it's such a good idea. Um, what, and, and I wouldn't mind, you know, we may have to be constrained to things that are available near us, which means eating an awful lot of cabbage and, <laughs> you know, pickled this and that through the winter. But um, that's more a more normal way uh, than the, the, the pre-industrial situation was very different. And not that long ago. I mean, we've only been doing this for such a short window of time. It but really people has think of it been. as normal. But obviously, you know, because of the timeline you've studied, how abnormal this moment is. This is a. It really is. What a bizarre moment of opulence where every individual, even our poorest, are living wealthier than most people throughout history have ever been able to. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, don't get me started. I go down this <laughs> rabbit hole and. Uh, we are supposed to be talking about food and plants. So. Well, can I, can I ask, do you think about the, the future of food much? I mean, cause this is, this part's interesting too. You were just talking about eating locally. We were talking about mm-hmm. organic, you know, I'm obviously being a, you know, somebody who forages and hunts. I, I really love local organic, clean food. Sure. Um, and I see this obviously a tremendous growing movement. I've been a part of it for for decades now, and I see it's really happening. On the Mm -hmm. other end of it, you have sort of a real dystopian possibility here with like 3D printed food made out of like four ingredients, you know, that's like managed by your insurance company and they tell you what you can So where do you kind of see food heading since you have such a, a much broader view historically, you know, than the average person would have? Man, I, I wish... I wish I could even speculate. I, I think we're, I think we're probably starting to turn around and go a little more in the right direction. Uh, you know, I think people have finally woken up to the fact that the green revolution didn't work. That you can't impose Western style agriculture on everyone in the world and expect it to work out well. And that those are systems that have been in many cases, you know, working well for thousands of years. Um, You know, it's all this accumulated cultural knowledge about the plants, the environment, what grows best in what setting. And you try to erase all that and just introduce fertilizers. You know, I I just, I I would like to see us go back to, um, you know, organic farming in a more traditional way. But as I said, I'm not sure it can feed everybody. So you raise the specter of this, you know, 3D printed yeah. food. <laughs> oh, it's just um, made of, a. I mean, soil and green. I mean, maybe we'll be I just, I just re <laughs> I just rewatched it. Do you know what year it was Did set you in? Really? Do you know what year it's set in? Uh, 
is it our Tw- year right now? 2022. 2022. <laughs> 20, Charles Heston, 2022. It's people. <laughs> it's people. Um, <laughs> wow. Well, there's. I, a- hopefully we won't get to that point. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I think, you know, th- there's so many aspects of this. I mean, fisheries, you know, that's, yeah. that's something, I mean, we're in terrible shape there. Uh, the ocean is getting messed up with climate change and everything's changing. And, um, you know, that probably dealing with that slowing the pace of global warming uh, would make things a lot better for us in the future. I mean, it could go highly artificial, as you as you say. I mean, synthetic foods, um, vitamin enriched. Um, a nutritionally adequate diet, but very boring. Yeah. Um, Even now, when you think about how many foods, you know, the average person would, well, probably the average person probably is vitamin D deficient, but would be much right. more so were it not that they fortify the milk, more exactly. more goitrogenic problems, were they not to mm-hmm. fortify the salt, um, mm-hmm. more B vitamin deficiencies, were they not fortifying the pasta and wheat products like bread? Mm-hmm. So it's like we're, it, it's strangely already, people are on a vitamin regimen that they probably don't realize that they're on in a sense, I mean, because the food becomes yeah, that's, bankrupt. that's quite and, true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I can't, um, I can't foresee, um, but I'm just hoping that it doesn't get too bad before I die. <laughs> before, before, <laughs> I know before that's a really terrible thing to green. say. <laughs> I don't have kids. I worry about people's kids. I worry about these college students. It's yeah. like, you guys have to fix this because yeah. we're yeah. too old now. I am, you know, yeah. and, yeah. um, you know, I was around in the seventies and, I'm tired. So, <laughs> so my students, you know, they have to deal with these problems. Um, so, but, no, I can't prognosticate very well about the future of food. Maybe something really cool like, you know, the Aztecs uh, grew blue green algae. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, maybe something, maybe looking more at microorganisms and fungi. Mm hmm. Yeah, these and their like, potential, which is huge. I hope we can do it in a. I hope it's not Monsanto who runs it. That's all. I uh, think <laughs> no, duh, huh. no. Well, they um, probably got a patent out on yeah, all kinds exactly. of things that haven't happened yet. Exactly. Um, there's a little blurb in the back of your book I really like. It's called Nostalgia for the Pleistocene. And you talk, I and mean, this is something I've, I've talked a lot in lectures I've given, and it was really cool to see it in there. You basically, if I, if I understood it right, you were saying sort of like the quest for fat and sugar are so normal and healthy mm-hmm. in the Homo sapiens. But yeah. now we live in an environment where we have constant, instant access to these things, mm-hmm. but we still have that ancestral appetite for them. And that's really difficult for us to control. And I think that's like, it, when I think about what could we do to improve people's health largely across, you know, the developed world, it's like, that's that just that knowledge. Like you're not bad for yeah. wanting sugar, but you got to be careful because you're not supposed to have access to so much of it, right? That's right. And there are so many companies trying to, you know, encourage you to eat it a lot more of it than you should have. And that's part of the problem too, is you know the marketing of uh, nutritionally um, inadequate foods. Um, so I don't know where exactly we go from here, but uh, it'll be interesting to see. What are you? Um, what do you anticipate for the field? The study of you know paleo diet essentially, and um, are, you know, are there? Are there things happening in the field right now that are exciting to you or, or has the field yeah. been out pretty well? No, no. I mean, I think it continues. People continue to refine some of the techniques that can be used for observation and for, uh, well, microscopy. Um, I don't know that much about how, how that field is developing now, but at one point it really gave a big boost to uh, the study of ancient plant remains. Uh, We have better, more accurate dating methods than we did before. And so I think that people continue to try to refine those methods. Um, There's a lot going on with stable isotopes. 
Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, that does, doesn't tell you specifics in terms of species in the diet, but it can tell you C4 versus C3 plants. That for uh, the listener is, is carbon isotopes that right. certain plants take up, right? So we know they were eating from this suite of plants or this suite of plants. Correct. Yeah. And in, in North America, it works uh, well. Uh, carbon-14, which is a stable isotope of normal old carbon, which is carbon-12. And that is a, the, the isotope, C, uh, I'm sorry, not C14, C13 is the stable one. Um, and C13 is elevated in maize because mm. maize is from Mexico. It's a more arid zone. It is a what's called a C4 plant. So it metabolizes differently. And so we can see that. That's a signature in human bones. When we see that high C13, we know that they're eating a lot of maize. Yeah. So that research has, you know, now come up against um, repatriation and reburial and you know, uh, native communities being partners in this process and uh, are not always willing to let the bones be studied in that way. Um, uh, but yeah. you can also apply car uh, st stable uh, isotope research to the plants themselves. So I think people working in that area are continuing to look at different isotopes of different elements and, you know, noticing how they might signal changes or differences in diet. So I think that's going to continue to develop. Uh, let's see what else. I think we've pretty much, you know, in terms of the field work, I think we've got that part figured out. There are some uh, micro-sized plant remains like pollen and phytoliths, which, is, which are these little silica bodies that form in plant cells and they take distinctive shapes. So sometimes you can uh, uh, identify a plant through one of those and people are continuing to investigate that uh, area. So I think it's continuing to grow. The study of ancient diets certainly is. Uh, there's some really interesting work being done on, on two million years ago and the shift to greater consumption of meat and the sequence of uh, scavenging and then persistent scavenging, uh, persistent inclusion of meat in the diet, eventually hunting. So uh, I think that area is going to expand too. There's still a lot more to be learned about early, our earliest um, ancestors, uh, earliest hominins, which were uh, beings like us that walked on two legs. Um, those ancestors uh, had a really interesting history. And so that's what people want to go to paleo diet. I think they're thinking pre-agricultural, um, that agriculture was, you know, harmful to us because of all the carbohydrates, um, other elements of the diet, you know, dairy is supposed to be bad for us. I don't, I don't, I don't buy into it. I think it's a, oh, I'm getting off on a tangent here. Please do, please do. Um, uh, the paleo diet, you know, if you look at the ingredients of it, it's a very healthful way to eat. Um, what, what I have a, an issue with is the idea that we need to look to our Neanderthal or, you know, earlier human ancestors to tell us how to eat. Um, you know, that's, I think that's a fallacious reasoning because we have evolved uh, since that time. Um, even dogs have an extra amylase gene, the, 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 uh, enzyme that digests starch. <laughs> I was going to say, cause my new puppy is certainly an omnivore compared to my other dog. Absolutely. My really? Oh my goodness. It's outrageous what this dog is. Yeah. Eats. Well, they've adapted to being with us. And so, obviously you're hinting at our amylase, I mean, sorry, our, uh, lactase persistence, which is, uh, a, a, an adaptation to dairy consumption. To eating dairy, right? There's that also. Um, so I think that it is a bit, bit misleading to, and as you say, trying to seek sort of this perfect answer, the, you know, the golden diet, 
Um, <laughs> I think the raw food people are on the wrong track. Oh, I did it for years, and I can. Did you really? Ask, oh, for ye- many, many years, I was quite well known in that world, and and uh, it's a very destructive to your body over time. You feel great at first over time. You know, and, and uh, you obviously know how old, you know, the fire, yeah. uh, our control and domestication of fire right. is. So I, I, fi- I think uh, the fact that fire predates Homo sapiens <laughs> yes. leads, leads me to believe it's probably Which it okay does. I think it years. does. I think a million years at least. Yeah, ago. right, right. So I always call these things the diet wars or the diet fats. I'm right. like, I always joke too, like who's going to write a book called – you know, like the omnivore diet. <laughs> it's just too boring. Well, I right? think it's, it's like, already been done. Isn't that kind of Michael Poland's thing? Yeah, I guess it kind of is. It kind of is. He's kind he, of, he, he leads pretty plant based, I'd say, you know, and sometimes pretty plant based, but he doesn't rule out meat and fish. Yeah, you know, it's true. just mostly, mostly plants. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, hey, I've been really enjoying our conversation. I wanted to ask you kind of one thing in closing. Um, I wanted to ask you about the cover of your book because I've been looking at this uh, image. Quite Don't a bit. Don't you love it? Isn't it wonderful? It's wonderful. Let me describe it to the viewer a little bit. It's like a. It looks like it takes place uh, on seaside flats. Um, mm-hmm. People in canoes. There's a weir that's been constructed, and some folks are standing in you know less than knee deep water spearing. Other folks though, are in a canoe, and in the middle of it's like a dugout canoe, and in the middle of it. They've got a fire going and a bunch of fish in the boat. Mm-hmm. And I've just been like, what am I looking at here? So what you tell me <laughs> about it. Fire. Well, this is, I mean, it's a whole fascinating story. I mean, it's, um, these illustrations were made by an artist called uh, John White, who was a participant in the, the lost colony of Roanoke, um, or what they call the lost colony. So it was a British settlement that lasted maybe a year um, didn't get resupplied and the people all disappeared and nobody knows exactly what happened to them. So, um, but John White, what, what was it? 1584. Um, there was a colony established on the coast of North Carolina, um, on the Island of Roanoke and, um, the colony failed ultimately. Um, but one of the English people who went there was John White, an artist, very talented watercolorist. And he um, made a series of wonderful and seemingly very true to life uh, drawings and sketches of the people. This is, you know, uh, the people who lived in coastal North Carolina at the time. Uh, drew their villages and drew some wonderful watercolors of the animals and plants that he saw. And that's, that's one of his scenes. So I think he was trying to um, fit in a lot of different aspects of subsistence and show, uh, I think there's a little puffer fish. I think there's a hammerhead shark down there somewhere under the water. Um, And uh, yeah, having the fire in the boat, that was that was kind of interesting too. But one of the reasons I picked it is I just think it's a wonderful uh, image. And it was, uh, the publisher was happy because it could be obtained at a reasonable cost. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, but the Roanoke colony uh, failed ultimately. So as, as I recall, there was supposed to be a supply ship that was supposed to return and bring more uh, food and was prevented from sailing from England for some reason. And when it came back the following year, the colonists had either dispersed or been killed or gone and joined uh, native groups in the area. So nobody really knows for sure. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I asked you about it. I'll, I'll follow up and look into that a little more deeply. And it's a fascinating story. There are a number of different books that people have written about about it. So. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I just uh, want to give you space if there's any kind of concluding thoughts that you have about uh, this topic or any other. Oh, or any others. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I think I've expressed enough opinions. I guess I just... Um, wish that more people knew more about the variety of 
foods and means of subsistence that humans have practiced over the years and, and to understand that the way you eat is not necessarily the only correct way to eat. <laughs> that there are different cultures that, you know, eat in different ways. And um, there's just that diversity out there and that it's been there for thousands yeah. of years. So, and I'm partly guilty. Well, I, I wrote my book, so I guess I had my say, my, my attempt to reach a public audience. Um, but I wish that people did know more about that. Yeah, well said. And I just want to say thank you for your time today. And thank you for your contribution to the field. Um, I really appreciated your book. And um, I just, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for the work that you do and your colleagues do. So uh, thank you so much. Appreciate and, it. Uh, it's been really lovely talking to you today. Great talking to you too. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a podcast guest or topic suggestion, or maybe a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host the Wild Fed TV show for? email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one or two of the Wild Fed TV show, go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 20 episodes. Season three of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2023. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed shirts, hoodies, hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed, food is all around you.